Straight Ahead on Law and Crime Daily, a guilty plea in the killing of a Utah college student. Also, arrests in an alleged plot to kidnap the Michigan governor. Plus, harsh words for Harvey Weinstein's legal team as new charges are filed. And we will remember them for the way they lived their good and decent lives. The Department of Justice plans to haul two alleged terrorists to court. Law and Crime Daily covers court cases from coast to coast. And welcome to Law and Crime Daily, everybody. I'm Aaron Keller, along with Brian Buckmeyer and Terry Austin. A dramatic guilty plea in the killing of a young woman in Salt Lake City, Utah, more than a year after a college student's charred remains were found. 23-year-old Mackenzie Lewick disappeared after taking a lift home from her grandmother's funeral. Ayula Ajahi admitted to strangling Lewick at his house, burning her body and burying it in his backyard. Ajahi's guilty plea came with a promise by prosecutors not to seek the death penalty. He's expected to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole later this month. The defendant admitted to meeting Lewick on an online dating website and planning her murder before she arrived at his house. He said he turned off his security video cameras, tied her hands behind her neck, and choked her. He reportedly had a contractor soundproof a room in his home, even adding hooks in concrete walls and a thumb lock. Ajayi's plea included counts for the forcible sexual abuse of a woman in a separate case as well. Prosecutors agreed to dismiss 19 felony charges of sexual exploitation of a minor stemming from child pornography allegedly found in the defendant's home during the execution of a search warrant. So, Terry, let's jump in with some analysis right now. The admitted level of planning right here is astonishing when we hear the admitted charges. It is astonishing, Aaron, and it makes you think twice about ever using a dating app. The level of planning from the soundproofing to the fact that he took his cameras out, I think we're kind of fortunate in a way that he was caught after this particular murder because, to me, it sounds as though he was planning to do multiple murders by creating an area where he could do this and get away with it. Brian, these are the kind of accusations that are very hard for defense attorneys. If you were defending this client, would you have advised him to take this deal, or how might you have defended him? Well, first, I, I don't advise clients to take deals. I merely illustrate the pros and cons of a case and help them understand what those charges mean if they were to plead guilty. And, the, and pleading guilty ultimately is their choice. However, based on the information we have here, I may lean a little bit harder on the fact that he should take a plea because identity is not an issue here and you have a decedent's body. Yeah, Brian, I mean, the, the evidence just stacking up here again, the premeditation, the motive and whatnot, this was a clearer cut case for prosecutors than it often is in many of the other cases we look at here. It is. I mean, aside from the charred remains and trying to prove identity, you look at his home and the preparation in his home, there's no real good reason why an individual will have those items in their home except for to murder someone. And it's really hard to work around that as a defense attorney. And Terry, fair deal here, a guilty plea in exchange for taking the death penalty off the table? Well, you know, it's a horrible thing for the family to have to go through. And I think that probably is fair because now they don't have to go through that trial. Exactly. We will be watching for the formal sentencing. Michigan authorities have announced the unraveling of a plot to try to kidnap the governor of that state. Six men are facing federal charges and seven more are facing state charges, including conspiracy to kidnap, supporting terrorist acts and gang membership. Some of the individuals are believed to be part of a rogue militia group. Court documents say an undercover FBI agent met with several members of the group in June and recorded one of the suspects saying he needed 200 men to storm the state Capitol building and take hostages, including Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Here was some of her response. Hatred, bigotry and violence have no place in the great state of Michigan. If you break the law or conspire to commit heinous acts of violence against anyone, we will find you, we will hold you accountable, and we will bring you to justice. New reaction to the additional charges levied in Los Angeles against former movie producer Harvey Weinstein. Weinstein faces the 
counts over the alleged rapes of two women. A total of 11 women have accused Weinstein of sex crimes in California. As Weinstein serves a 23-year sentence in New York, the California crimes are said to have occurred between 2004 and 2013. Brian Buckmeyer, you recently spoke with Weinstein's defense attorneys about the process to move the defendant to the West Coast. Yes, I did, Aaron. Uh, attorney Imran Ansari is a frequent guest of the Law and Crime Trial Network. He shed some light on the process prosecutors will use to pull Weinstein to the West Coast and how Weinstein will fight the charges. Remember, the first batch of L.A. charges came just as Weinstein's New York trial was beginning. Initially, those initial charges on, I believe, January 6th, which was the eve of jury selection uh, in the New York case. Now, they added these other charges uh, and uh, we don't expect that they're going to back away from that. And I, I have a feeling they're going to be seeking extradition when that time is appropriate. So, Imran, I'm glad you brought up the point of extradition because that's the next question I wanted to follow up with. We know that Harvey Weinstein is being held in Buffalo, New York, and there's a pending uh, extradition hearing coming up early December. Can you give us your thoughts about the mechanics of that and how that might work out for him specifically? Sure. Well, you know, L.A. was seeking extradition earlier on. Um, we were able to move that date uh, to a hearing December 11th, when the question of extradition is again going to be before the court. Um, and there are certain factors that need to be taken into consideration. That's going to be uh, primarily uh, the uh, health emergency that's really sh shocking uh, and rocking the country, and whether it's going to be safe uh, for him to be extradited at that time. That is going to be something that's going to be looked at. And if it's not, I would expect that we, uh, arguments will be presented to the court that extradition is premature uh, due to the health uh, crisis and dangers uh, at hand. So, Imran, you talked about the dangers of transporting an individual from one state to another, yet alone New York to California. Are there any specific concerns or general concerns that Harvey Weinstein has in terms of being transported from Buffalo, New York to L.A., California? Yeah, sure, Brian. Well, you know, of course, to protect uh, my client's privacy interest in his health and information, I can't go into real specifics, but it's really no secret that um, Harvey Weinstein is currently not in the best uh, state of health. Um, he has multiple problems with his back and orthopedic problems, and that's why you saw him using the walker during the trial. He's also having some other uh, health issues that really put him in, in a state where uh, he could be at risk. So if, if transporting him at a time when uh, coronavirus is really spiking in, in either of these two areas is something going to, you know, that the court is going to have to consider whether that they, uh, uh, you know, push through this extradition to L.A. Now, Imran, as we're looking at this, he's facing a total of 11 counts of sexual assault in L.A. There are allegedly five uh, women who are coming forward based on these counts. What are Harvey Weinstein's position as to these allegations? So Harvey Weinstein stands by what he's been saying uh, from inception regarding uh, these allegations and any allegations uh, that, uh, you know, nothing was non-consensual if it even happened. Um, and he intends to defend himself. He intends to put on a vigorous defense uh, and maintain his innocence in light of these charges. Weinstein accuser Louise Godbold said the new charges brought her some comfort, but also slammed one of Weinstein's New York trial attorneys. We're still obviously only scraping the surface. And the sad thing about all of this is that with the statute of limitations, there are very many people, including myself, who will never get to see our day in court. Is it possible to get some sense of justice looking at the way the cases are proceeding that can proceed under the statute of limitations? It's gratifying that so many women have come forward and I came forward in order to support them. It's also very satisfying to be able to support my sisters, the fellow survivors. And I have to say that rather than just looking in um, punitive terms for Harvey, it's also been a real lease of life to have the connection with all of these women who are pretty amazing women. What's some of their reaction been to the additional charges? You know, this is actually one stage in a very long journey. So it's been an emotional roller coaster. All of us felt very invested in the New York trial, despite the fact that you know, only a few of us were actually leading the charge on that one. So the collective sense is that slowly the wheels of justice are grinding inex inexorably on. The whole Me Too movement was an outcry from millions of women who know exactly how we feel. So there are those 
women actually who are still dealing with their internalized misogyny uh, who will make comments about, well, they should never have gone up to that hotel room. It sounds like you may be speaking a little bit there to Donna Rotuno. You got the reference. Donna Rotuno was disgusting. I, I certainly hope that she's not, not still on the scene. Harvey doesn't like losers, and she lost. So I'm not sure that he will be employing her again, but who knows? Uh, but this is not a fight among women, and this is not a fight between us and any particular attorney. This is our desire to see justice done and to make sure that Harvey doesn't get out of prison so that he can't hurt any more women. A Wisconsin police officer will not face charges for shooting a teenager outside a suburban Milwaukee mall. Prosecutors there say Wauwatosa officer Joseph Mensa had a reasonable belief that deadly force was necessary in the February shooting. 17-year-old Alvin Cole was killed. The county district attorney released this surveillance video purportedly showing Cole with a stolen handgun. Authorities, or investigators rather, say Cole fired a round while fleeing from responding officers. Squad car video captures the chase. Cole pointed the gun in the direction of the officers, reports say, and police shot him five times. And still ahead here on Law and Crime Daily, a legal maneuver by the school district where the Parkland school shooting happened is drawing harsh criticism from victims. Plus, the Attorney General of Kentucky files new court papers demanding privacy, not transparency, over the police shooting of Breonna Taylor. Our analysis right after this. Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron is fighting in court to prevent a grand juror from speaking out about the police shooting death of Breonna Taylor. The AG's office filed court papers arguing that allowing a grand juror to talk would make a mess of the Kentucky legal system because the public and prosecutors must, in his opinion, have confidence in the secrecy of the grand jury process. Cameron also noted that a grand juror in Missouri was prevented several years ago from talking about the police shooting of Michael Brown and that a similar ban on grand jurors speaking out should also apply in Kentucky. So, Terry, this is an interesting concept, an interesting tactic from the AG here to say secrecy should rule the day. Should it? Why or why not? I absolutely think it should not prevail. And in fact, transparency must prevail of all cases. This case is the case where it took over six months and, you know, March is when she was shot. And it wasn't until September that we got an indictment. And the indictment wasn't even for the death of Breonna Taylor. So that's the one disturbing fact. The other disturbing fact is that it was not transparent here. And initially, the authorities said there was no body cam. And now, all of a sudden, there is body cam. So when you We've find that there that. are issues that are, you know, different here, and you want to know exactly what the grand jury saw. Exactly. And, you know, the other issue we've got here, Brian, is that uh, police were saying that, uh, you know, hey, look, uh, you know, there's a high-powered weapon that Breonna Taylor shot, and now they're turning around saying, no, that wasn't the case. So, Terry, you got to jump to another story now. Big case making waves, the civil litigation over the 2018 Parkland, Florida shooting. Terry, bring us up to speed on that. Well, another big case making the waves, you're right. Parents who sued the Broward County School District after their children were killed are now being asked to prove their mental anguish. 17 students died in the attack at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Many of their parents are suing the school, blaming the district for failing to identify and stop the threat posed by the accused shooter, Nicholas Cruz. The district is now demanding the parents turn over their psychiatric records. One so, Terry, it's was... relatively common in some civil cases for people to have to prove some physical manifestation of injuries in order to actually press a claim. So here, is it required? And if it is, is it insensitive in a situation that's this dramatic? Well, you know, sometimes, Aaron, you have to show the length of the distress or the, you know, severity of the distress. But, you know, in this type of case where you have children who were shot and killed and the parents are obviously showing some emotional distress, the 
witnesses should be able to testify. You should not have to go into their psychiatric records or their, you know, physical records from their physicians. So I think that the county is really pushing here, and it is an invasion of privacy. So, Brian, oftentimes lawyers have to do things that uh, rub people the wrong way in defense of a client or an organization. Is this one of those cases, or do you think they should just handle this a different way? I think this might be one of those situations where lawyers are going to get the short end of the stick in the public eye. Um, another way to look at it is that the defense attorney here, the ones representing the school district, have to ensure that the claims are serious enough that when it comes to negotiating or whether or not to go to trial, they have to protect the interests of their clients and also the students who still reside there. Taking money out of their pockets is not helpful for the school district, and that framing of the mindset, I think, is how defense attorneys really go about this. It's a tough legal situation, but again, in theory, the district could just say, we're going to waive this if it wanted. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, Texas authorities charge, a, charge Netflix rather with a crime over a controversial new film, and the U.S. Department of Justice plans to haul two suspected terrorists into American courts to answer for the killings of citizens overseas. Two alleged ISIS terrorists are now on U.S. soil to face the American criminal justice system. Former British citizens Alexander Cote and Al Shafi El Sheikh were part of the ISIS guards known as the Beatles. The group is believed to be tied to dozens of kidnappings and responsible for the deaths of at least four Americans. The U.S. had to agree to not seek the death penalty in exchange for the men's extradition. The men face up to life in prison if convicted of eight charges involving hostage-taking and terrorism. Here was the Department of Justice's message for the victims' families and for the accused. Today's announcement is the result of many years of hard work in the pursuit of justice for these Americans. We have been inspired by their memories and moved by the determination and grit of their families. Families which will never rest until justice is done. To them, I say this, neither will we. As for Cote and Al Sheikh, like many other terrorists before them, they have underestimated the American resolve to obtain justice for our fellow citizens who are harmed or killed by terrorists anywhere in the world. These men will now be brought before a United States court to face justice for the depraved acts alleged against them in the indictment. The DOJ also paused to remember the victims and share their stories. James Foley was a print and video journalist who was covering the civil war in Syria. He had previously served as a conflict zone correspondent in Iraq and then in Libya. James was a former elementary school teacher. Stephen Sotloff was a journalist who covered the Middle East and was in Syria reporting on the refugee crisis. According to a longtime friend, he was drawn to the region to, quote, give a voice to the people who didn't have one, close quote. Stephen was the grandson of Holocaust survivors who inspired him to be that voice. Peter Kassig was in Syria working for a humanitarian organization that he founded to deliver food and medical aid to the refugees. He had previously served as an elite airborne ranger in the U.S. Army, which included service in Iraq. Kayla Mueller was a humanitarian aid worker and human rights activist who, inspired by her faith, devoted much of her young life to serving those in need both at home and abroad. As President Trump shared during his 2020 State of the Union address, the American warriors who conducted the military operation that resulted in the death of ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi were in so inspired by Kayla that they named the mission Task Force 814, a reference to August 14th, Kayla's birthday. And when we come back here on Law & Crime Daily, killer dad Chris Watts getting some attention while behind bars from some interesting admirers. Law & Crime Daily returns in just a moment.
Let's wrap up now with a couple of other cases in the news right now. Colorado dad Chris Watts admitted he murdered his wife and children, but he's apparently getting fan mail in prison. People magazine reports that Watts is spending his time behind bars corresponding with multiple women. The magazine cites an unnamed source saying the pen pals thought Watts was handsome and felt compassion for him, even though he murdered his family after meeting a new girlfriend. Watts had nothing better to do, the magazine reports, so he started writing back, and the conversations kept going. Netflix is facing a interesting legally here, indicting a company on a criminal charge. Explain that for us. Well, you know, under the law, corporations are considered legal persons, so they can be sued both civilly and criminally. And in Texas, that fine could triple or double because if the court finds that the company benefited financially, then the penalty goes up. So we could be facing up to about $20,000 here. Brian, got to ask you about Chris Watts here. Uh, what's going on with the pen pals uh, behind prison walls? If he was your client, would you tell him to be answering these people back, or does he just have nothing to lose at this point? I don't think he has anything to lose, Aaron. And when I was single, I was trying to find a date in New York, but somehow my clients could find dates all the time. I don't know what it is. Clients always have ad admirers out there, and it just seems to be another par for the course. Yeah, I mean, I guess when you've got nothing but time on your hands, when you're behind prison, you can respond to questions like that. So, Brian, Terry, appreciate the uh, insight here on these many cases that we've been talking about on Law and Crime Daily. Appreciate very much you joining us for these discussions about justice in America. We'll see you back here next time. And, of course, live trials on Law and Crime Network.